Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to join us today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokomnele. We are on DTT because we're free to on DSTV channel 4 to 1 and Go TV channel 1 to 5. We are your home of independent fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, Public Accounts Committee of Parliament orders a great ministry to immediately compensate farmers affected by the avian influenza outbreak between 2015 and 2018. We have details for you shortly. Also, organized labor says it has not received official communication from government indicating the withdrawal of the 15% VAT on electricity consumption as it indicates it will continue with its planned actions. We have more coming from the labor front. Um, you see that most of our institutions are on red bands. We've outlined series of activities um, towards the final demonstration. Last air quality in Accra reported to have reached hazardous levels according to air monitoring index site IQA. We have details of that report shortly, which is advising the public to mask up. We are also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and X Spaces via Joy News on TV. My personal handle is at the Nana Aisha. Please do stay for details. <music> Organized Labour says it has not received any official communication from government indicating the withdrawal of the 15% VAT on electricity consumption. The TUC says it will continue with its planned protest, which kick-started today with the wearing of red headbands to compel the government to withdraw a 15% VAT on electricity consumption. The workers say if the government fails to withdraw the directive, they will stage a massive demonstration on February 13. Listen to... TUC Vice Chair Ken Kudia. If you went around, you see that most of our institutions are on red bands. We've outlined series of activities um, geared towards the final demonstration. So, uh, beginning with red band today, and then it continues to the point where government, if it doesn't step in, then we we'll have to shut out our offices. We are certain that that IMF will surely compel or um, let the government come up with uh, policies that would always affect the, the, the workers' income. I mean, that, that's ultimate. Whatever comes up is going to affect our purchasing power, the value of our income. And we would wait one at a time. For now, it is the, the VAT issue. We know that there could be other in the, others in the pipeline water will come up shortly but we are uh, resolved that in all this government must first consult let's engage let's talk there could be other options other alternatives for all of us than the, the unilateral decisions that government seek to approach government seeks to, to to always take so if there's emission in the pipeline officially we've not received that communication yet once it comes to our attention, I'm sure Labour will meet and take the the decision. Uh, we've sent notices to all our regions. We've written to the IGP. We've written to regional uh, regional police commanders. We've written to our regional um, officers. We've asked every union to write to its employer, informing them of our intentions. All the worker leaders in every institution have been given the itinerary and series of actions. So we, we, we've done whatever we have to do um, in, so the last day where we we'll all come out and lock our offices and be on the street. Meanwhile, the Ghana Union Traders Association also says it strongly opposes the proposed implementation of the electricity and emission levies due to the detrimental economic consequences it will have on businesses. Listen to Guta President Dr. Joseph Obing. He spoke earlier on the AM show. We've been talking about cost of doing business and it is actually um not helping us in terms of um, uh, payment of duty in terms of payment of taxes especially 
the challenges that we have with the VAT uh, strata is not helping um, the, the cost of trading at all. And so and then if you think about inflation, it has eaten up the purchasing power of the consuming public. And so uh, it also affects the, the rate of turnover that we used to enjoy. And so um, this is the state of uh, doing business now. Now, um, um, uh, the indicators are getting right. And um, we, we expect that we do things that will help us sustain um, the, the gains that we are having. And unfortunately, um, um, the, um, the government keep piling the, the taxes that will come and then um, halt this, um, um, the gains that we are having. And that's why we are talking against the new taxes, because right. at least um, we are able to achieve exceedingly our revenue target. So if this electricity tax and then emission is a form of um, a ta um, enhancement of um, the revenue uh, collection, then of course, um, we are just thinking about revenue without thinking about uh, productivity. Because we, uh, government itself knows that we cannot overtask ourselves out of production. We'll take you live to the TUC office where there's a meeting between Clock, Clock Sag and the TUC. My colleague Kenneth Jesse is there to bring us all the updates. But right now, let's head to Parliament where the Public Accounts Committee has directed the immediate payment of funds allocated to the Ministry of Agric meant to compensate farmers affected by the avian influenza between 2015 and 2018. According to the Auditor General's report, about 1.8 million cities earmarked for the compensation continue to lie in the accounts of the ministry, which has failed to disburse the funds. At the Public Accounts Committee sitting on Monday, Chairman of uh, the Public Accounts Committee, Dr. James Kluche Averji, directed that the ministry effect the payments within one month. I've been joined by my colleague, Kwekwa Sante, who is monitoring affairs for us. Kwekwa Sante, what more are we picking up from the uh, Public Accounts Committee sitting? Well, Aisha, so between 2015 and 2018, the avian influenza devastated farms in the greater Accra region and other parts of the country. Government made specific budgetary commitments to compensate farmers who have been affected by this. But so many years on, these payments have not been made and the farmers have been complaining. In fact, when the Auditor General went on fact finding, he found out that the money that were meant to pay these farmers were actually lying dormant in the ministry's accounts and the demand now from the public accounts committee through its chairman is that the agri ministry makes this payment immediately to the affected farmers but also one issue that has uh, that has come up quite strongly at the public accounts committee today is the matter of unearned salaries agency after agency there are so many people in these ministries departments and agencies who are getting paid every month for no work done some of them on steady leave some of them completely abandoning their posts but, have, but having to receive money every month. This is a position the Public Accounts Committee is taking seriously. In fact, we've, we've heard from Roxanne Nelson, the farmer, who is, who is asking the committee to take a stronger position on it, get Yoko and the Ghana police involved to arrest these persons who are earning so much money but are not doing anything in these government departments and agencies, Aisha. Kwekwa Sante, so what uh, is uh, on the agenda after this? Uh, is there any other uh, ministry or any other agency coming to face the Public Accounts Committee? Well, last week, the boss of the National Sports Authority was expected to be here. He wasn't. And today, I was just seeing him in the committee room. It means that very soon he will be there. He's expected to face tough questions from members like Sam George, who have been raising concerns about the renting out of the Accra Sports Stadium and other such sports stadiums across the country for concerts and church events without proper maintenance schedule. So he is there. Very soon we expect that he'll take his seat. Currently on the hot seat is the, the head of the local government service, Dr. Dan, a, a engineer Dr. Dana Atwatha, who's been responding to concerns, mainly revolve, uh, revolving around matters of unearned salaries, Aisha. Kukwa Sante is our correspondent in Parliament. Definitely will bring you more from the Public Accounts Committee setting, which is still underway. Let's go back to the labor unrest. My colleague Kenneth JC has been interacting with Clock Sag, an organized labor who say they will still embark on their strike to demand for the withdrawal of the 15% VAT on electricity consumption. He joins me now with more. Ken, we understand that union members have declined speaking on tape, but off camera, 
What have you observed and what have they been telling you? Hello, Kenneth. We understand that the union members are declining to speak to you on tape, but off camera, what have you yourself observed and what have they been telling you? Right, so we'll try and bring back Kenneth JC, who's been monitoring this for us. And uh, we are still live on Joy News today. We're coming to you from our studios in Kokum Limli. We are on DTT because we're free to wear. Accra is currently uh, has the worst air quality in the world, according to IQ Air. The current air pollution in the city is 61 times the WHO annual air quality guideline value. Kokwa Sante has been sharing details of that report with us if you look at the world ranking now ghana is ranked the worst and in fact if you look at the data from from months gone by it used to be india that used to have this very poor quality air quality in fact if you step out now and you look at the atmosphere you see that the weather is really polluted so let me take you through the ranking you see a crack ghana ranking 313 that is the aqi us and then the next closest is Mumbai in India. That is 171, which tells you that, in fact, if you look at the, 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 the poor quality of the atmosphere in Ghana, it is almost double what you see in India now. And it has been so over the past few years. And in fact, if you look at 313 that we are scoring on the ranking now, the, the appropriate measure, which is a moderate, is from zero to 50. So you need to score between zero and 50 to be able to breathe in some quality air. And Ghana is currently having 300 and 13 currently, and that is a lot. In fact, if you if you if you do an in-depth analysis of why Ghana is scoring that much, they don't provide so much detail, but they say that the air quality in Ghana now is very, very unhealthy, and they advise people to put on masks, to use humidifiers and other things to be able to, to, to get that. They are supposed to avoid outdoor exercise, close windows, get an air purifier, wear a nose mask, among other things. In fact, over the past few years, there have been some studies that have gone into to necessarily specify why this is so. Some have sought to put it down to the hamatan, but some of us have done the comparative analysis that this is not the first time we are recording hamatan or the dry season in the country. It has not always been like this. It's a testament to climate change and also the burning of refuse, among other things. And so, in fact, if you look at certain segments in Accra, if you look at Agbogulushi, you look at the University of Ghana, if you look at the, the area around the, 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 the U.S. Embassy in Ghana, the, the air quality differs a little bit, but the general view is that the, the, the atmosphere is really polluted in Accra. On your election headquarters, there's some simmering confusion in the new patriotic party in the Offensive North constituency, which is in a state of disarray as supporters of the incumbent MP Collins and team are accusing fans of the newly elected parliamentary candidate, Dr. Fred Chia Samwa, of attacking them exactly a week after the constituency's party primaries. Constituency Vice Chairman of the party, Dr. William Kwabena, Nanchi at a press briefing says the situation, if not addressed, could lead to the party, could lead the party into opposition in December 2024. And I have it, more. The new patriotic party went to the polls on the 27th of January to elect new parliamentary candidates across 104 constituencies where the party has certain members of parliament and here in the Offensive North constituency, the incumbent who has been in office for the past 15 years, Collins Augustine team, lost his bid to represent the party in the 2024 polls. Moments after the shocking news hit the ground, his 22-year-old son, Rabbi Ntim Dapa, was also pronounced dead after receiving the news of his dad's shocking defeat. Even before the elections, there were signs of a turmoil with both supporters of the incumbent and the newly elected PC pointing accusing fingers at each other. Exactly a week after the polls, the constituency is charged again after supporters of the incumbent member of parliament Collins Augustine and team were allegedly attacked by thugs from the camp of the newly elected candidate Dr. Fred Chi Asamoa after they were allegedly prevented from attending the one week celebrations of the late son of the defeated candidate. Here is one of the attacked persons narrating to join news how he was attacked. 
I met a number of people in front of my house and I overheard them saying that they will kill someone today. So I asked one of them what happens if they kill and leave the body there and the police comes over. And one of them asked, who am I to ask them that question? Soon after, one of them stabbed me from a blind side, and then the rest of them, about 40 of them, started beating me up. Another victim of the attack who lives closer to the residence of the newly elected candidate says his structure has been demolished by the unknown tax who were allegedly hired by the new candidate. I had a call that my house is being attacked. When I got there, I realized that they demolished my structure, including my fence wall, and then beating my daughter too. Constituency Vice Chairman of the party, Dr. William Kobnatne, she bemoans the insecurities being recorded across the constituency before and after the polls. Any gathering we attend of late, we are recording violence acts. Just today, we saw tax, tax, beating people around, causing commotion, and I mean, beating and, and injuring people within the constituency. Officer Nov have never recorded such violence acts in Officer Nov. He further asked that the party's success is in limbo ahead of the next elections if the situation is not addressed. All we are calling for is the unity. Now, we are calling the new parliamentary candidate to call the party executives, call the patrons, call his supporters, and then call for unity so that we all sit down to look at the way forward. As it stands now, we believe that it will, if we continue like this, we are likely to lose the party or to lose the power to uh, NDC. The other faction who were alleged to have carried out the attack says the information peddled out there is false as they were rather attacked by supporters of the defeated candidate Collins Augustine and team when they visited in King Kansu to commemorate with the MP who lost his son. Baba Ubakar is the immediate past second vice chairman of the party. It is not true. They, even yesterday, they even uh, gave us warning not to come to the funeral. But we, uh, we didn't hear them because we know Honorable AC Intim is our current MP. And so far as uh, 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 he lost his son, it's all, uh, uh, all of us, not only him. So we have to uh, mobilize and go and help him. But uh, 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 since uh, they started attacking us, we all uh, <laughs> withdraw uh, 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 our support of him. The incident has left the people of the area in a state of fear following the packets of electoral violence recorded across the constituency. District Chief Executive of Offensive North, who doubles as the chairman of the District Security Council, Albert Sefa Bwampon, who, who condemned the act, says the security are fully in charge of the situation and perpetrators of violence will be brought to book. I have talked to the police commander, he is in charge, and I want to encourage the citizens. Everybody should go on his normal duties. Police is in charge, they will make sure that no problem happens to anybody. But all those behind these things, they should be caught, they should be careful, so that nobody will be held by the police, else the law will take its course. Thank Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Akumadai. Delegates of the New Patriotic Party in Doma East constituency have endorsed incumbent member of parliament Paul Chumberima as a party's parliamentary candidate through a popular acclamation. Parliamentary Affairs correspondent Kwekwa Sante reports. Paul Chumberima was the only candidate to have successfully filed his nomination to represent the governing party in the 2024 election in that constituency. Over 500 delegates participated in the special delegates conference where the MP was approved without contest following his success during the party's vetting process. Supervised by the Electoral Commission in the region, the exercise was also observed by the regional and constituency executives of the NPP. In expressing his gratitude during the conference, Paul Chumberima thanked the delegates for their renewed confidence 
in him. It is about hard work and, uh, and the confidence the good people of Ramai have once again reposed in me. Clearly, it is, it is important for you to serve. Every leader, the first point of call for you is to serve. And Ramai people feel that Port Chuberma has served them well. Therefore, they want to give you that opportunity to once again represent them at the ninth parliament, where Dr. Mamad Baumia will be the next president of this great country. And I think that is why they gave me that opportunity. Bono Regional Secretary of the NPP, Kofi Ofusubwatin, extolled the virtues of Paul Chumberma as a rising star within the NPP. Mama is if you have followed the trajectory of electoral votes. Each election, presidential elections, Bama is the lever for the Bunu region in terms of popular votes. They run number four. So that's how important this constituency is. So we are all glad, we are all happy. And the nature of this individual, Paul Chumbeima, is, is so distinguishing. He's one that has come into the region as a first time member of parliament who's been able to bring along often constituencies in the region. Six of constituencies in the region. You can feel his impact. You can feel the job that he does, even beyond his own constituency. Member of the party's national communication team, Kwesi Bodri, implored the vice president, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, to consider nominating Paul Chumberima as his running mate for the 2024 election. Talk about health. So far, a lot of things are going on in this constituency about health. Clearly, Honorable Chumberima is, a, is, is an epitome of patriotism, hard work, and dedication. And I'm confident that most of the young people in the new patriotic party are looking out to him. You know that the new patriotic party boasts of having the men. And clearly, Honorable Chumberima is one of the men we have in, in, in the new patriotic party. I do not think that the NPP needs a clear cut as person. We only need an account to complement the candidature of the vice president. And an account can come from the Ashanti region or the Bono region. I would be glad if it goes to the Ashanti region, but I will also be excited if it comes to the Bono region because they all form part of the new patriotic party. Clearly where we are now, we do not even need a running mate from the Ashanti region. We need to complete the roads in the Ashanti region, make sure we are commissioning the airport and engaging a lot of infrastructure projects in the Ashanti region. That is what we need. The Ashantis will come out to overwhelmingly endorse the new patriotic party. But that's for the running mate. We need an account. We don't necessarily need an Ashanti, but we need an account. And Bono Region falls into the equation. Thank you. Paul Chumberima will be looking forward to winning again in Doma East to enter parliament for the second time in 2025. NDC, the Anna of Dagbon Abubakar II has admonished the NDC flag bearer to focus on building a legacy by ensuring development in the country if successful in the upcoming elections. He says this consideration should be treasured above the curse to amass riches for his family. In a speech read on his behalf, uh, he encouraged the former president to run a clean campaign devoid of name calling. He further cautioned against appointees whose corrupt deeds may negatively affect his presidency. The NDC flag bearer has taken the building Ghana tour to the northern region. And Nanaya Ojima joins us with more from there. Nanaya Ojima, how has the NDC flag bearer been receiving this from the IANA? So the NDC flag bearer after the IANA um, had his turn to speak or to address the NDC and John Mahama also uh, was given the opportunity to speak to the people and the IANA. But before we talk about John Mahama, let's go back to the IANA and some of the things that he has been saying. Very important among the things that he said to John Mahama is that he should ensure that the best of people are appointed into his government to ensure that he's able to leave the legacy that the Yana is seeking. He says that one thing that should be constant in his government is that there should be reshuffling so he gets the best of people to help um, prosecute the agenda to build Ghana to the standard that all the all Ghanaians are looking for. And he says that Ghanaians will not forgive John Mahama if he refuses to build the kind of Ghana that we are all seeking for. Um, further, on, on the part of John Mahama, when he took a stand, he congratulated Diana for the role that he has played in ensuring that there is peace in Gabon. 
he spoke about some security issues that recently um, he learned that were, you know, were, were, were came up in the area. And Diana has teamed up with some people in the local assembly to ensure that the armed robbery and other security threats in the area were, were kept. And what John Mahama is saying is that when he is appointed, or when he is elected president, he will ensure that security is beefed up in the area to help deal with the situation. Also, John Mahama touted some of his achievements in, uh, in Yengi and its environs when he was made, he spoke specifically of a water project that was to save the people of Yendi. And he says that when he returns to power, he will ensure that this water, pro um, this water project is completed. And these, the exact words he said is that he will ensure that the Yana it never goes thirsty again. So he has been speaking about other projects that he, he is looking at developing in this area. He spoke about the hospital facility for the people here that's upgrading the current health facility in END. He has been talking about the road project within the area and other things that he intends to, 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 to um, develop to ensure that this area um, gets the necessary improvement in facility or infrastructure as needed. From there, John Mahama will move to the um, Yendi Senior High School where a town hall meeting will be held. And after that, uh, he will move from the Yendi area to Gushegu and complete today's tour at Miom. Um, in these areas, he will hold um, town hall meetings in the areas. And after uh, before the, these town hall meetings, he will make sure that he meets the traditional authorities in these areas. The tour of the northern region will be in, uh, it will be for two days, as he has been doing in all the areas that he has so far visited. Now, Jima, with that report from the building Ganatwa with the NDC flag bearer. Thank you for that update. Let's get on to other stories. Imperial Home Ghana Limited, a real estate firm, is marking 15 years of successful business existence. During a health walk by the company CEO Frank James Fiaboa, he assured clients of continuous apartment development that meets their preferences and specifications. <laughs> Imperial Homes Ghana has carved a niche for itself in the real estate industry with its custom luxurious homes, which deliver modern architectural styling and supreme functionality and comfort. Its apartments are carefully crafted to suit the unique taste of clients. The company also delivers service offerings which cuts across construction, project management and property development with a team of highly skilled and experienced professionals. The company has most of its embellished apartments dotted across prime areas in Accra, including Airport Hills and cantonments, as well as Osu here in Accra. A health walk was organized by the management to mark 15 years of the company's existence and set another milestone. Executive Director of Imperial Homes, Frank Jemfi Iabua, pledged the company's commitment to develop a strong and healthy community for the country. Today, as we reflect on our accomplishment, it is important to recognize the importance of not only building homes, but also fostering a healthy and an active lifestyle. The health work that we undertook today symbolizes our commitment to the well-being of our community. Just as we have constructed steady and beautiful homes, we must also prioritize the construction of a strong and a healthy community. As we traverse this path together, let us remember that good health is the foundation and the cornerstone on which we build our aspirations. Director of Imperial Charity Foundation, Nana Ansa Kwao IV, touted the philanthropic achievements of the company, indicating health and education remain the focal areas. So there's a charity foundation attached to Imperial Homes. And so when they build their houses and they make money, they give me some. And then I reach out to the community. So we do health, 
education mainly. And uh, I feel it's the most significant part of the company. We operate in the very niche end of the market. And so very few percentage of Ghanaians, you know, patronize what we do. And so how then do the others benefit is by reaching out. And so uh, we've done quite a lot of projects. We refurbished the first floor ward or Kolebu maternity ward. And then we went back. So we're going to do a actually renovation for them again. Uh, just to, no, a week ago, we donated beds to Medina Polyclinic. We're giving beds to Kolebu again. Indeed, we have some more beds. So if there's anybody watching and they need, they need some beds in their local hospital, they can always reach out and we'll, you know, give them a couple. Uh, we built a school in Hogbo. Uh, uh, airport police station, we, you know, kidded them out. And we've done a lot of reaching out in terms of health and education. And so that's my part I play in Imperial Homes. And, uh, you know, going forward, we are hoping to do more. We're really hoping to do more uh, because I think that's the only way society would benefit from you know a company. Because if a company has lasted 15 years, by all means you owe it, you owe it to the the society it survives in. And how do we do that by reaching out? The company is keen on contributing to the reduction of the housing deficit in the country, which hovers around 1.8 million units. That's a live on Join News today. We take a break when we return to this business. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to the business segment on Join News today with me, Pios Kojo Baka. Fitch Solutions is forecasting upside risks to the country's interest rate projection. That's according to its latest article dubbed more interest rate cuts on the way in Ghana following cautious start of easing cycle. Here's more. The UK-based firm said an escalation in geopolitical tensions could disrupt global trade leading to further increases in global commodity prices. As Ghana is a net importer of both fuel and food items, such an increase would raise the cost of imports and disrupt the disinflation process. It added there's also a risk that negotiations between Ghana and its commercial creditors will stall and take longer than currently anticipated. This would delay international monetary fund disbursements and weaken investor confidence, resulting in a sell-off of the CD and a resurgence of inflation. In both scenarios, it said the Bank of Ghana would embark on a more conservative monetary easing cycle than currently forecast. The National Democratic Congress is committing to the activation of the cargo export intention of the Temale Airport for agricultural product exportation. Now, flag bearer of the party, John Dramani Mahama, says export of vegetables to Europe is one of the reasons for the investment in the northern region. Here's a report. The NDC's Building Ghana Tour, which is soliciting public suggestions in drawing the party's 2024 election manifesto continues to hold town hall meetings for the purpose. In meetings held at the Upper East region, calls for job opportunities for the youth were intensified. Due to the agriculture potential of the area, the NDC intends to create jobs through the improvement of factors affecting the sector. The Tamale International Airport remains vital in the established plan of the John Mahama-led government if successful in staging a comeback to power. Mr. Mahama explains the intentions for the airport's expansion in his term includes exportation of agriculture products. When we designed Tamale International Airport, our intention was that it will not just be a passenger airport, but it will serve the whole of the north in terms of exporting vegetables and other products to Europe because it is shorter from Tamale to Europe, it takes you five hours, than from Accra to Europe. And so if we are growing vegetables here, we have pack houses, we are packing those vegetables and we're taking them to Tamale and putting them on flights to Europe, a lot of money will come back into the northern sector of the country. 
And so we'll build the cargo center at the Tamale Airport so that all the products that we produce from here that are exportable, we'll be able to pack them nicely and send them to Tamale and fly them to Europe for export. The NDC flag bearer is committing to the revival of cotton cultivation, which served as revenue generation for farmers in off-season. He explains how. We had three generals. One was here in the Upper East, one was in Tumu, and one was in, uh, uh, um, in Tamale. And they used to buy all the cotton that was grown. That was the product that used to give our parents cash because they paid cash for it. Our parents grew crops to feed our families, sorghum, millet, guinea corn, groundnuts, maize. And then getting to the end of the farming season, they put cotton into the crops. And after they have harvested their food, the cotton grows, they pick the cotton, and they go and sell it to the ginry, and they get cash to look after their families. We're going to revive the cotton industry. On creating employment through industrialization, the Pualugu Tomato Factory, which could not be sustained after retooling by the former president, John Ajekun Kufo, remains relevant in the NDC's plan. And so we're going to revive the Pualugu tomato factory and we're going to involve the irrigation farmers in the tunnel area to produce enough tomatoes to feed that factory so that we can create employment for our young people here. Already, the NDC flag bearer says some investors have shown interest in reviving the Zualungu meat factory. He emphasized on the role of the Wulugu livestock station. And so we'll revive the Zwarungu meat factory using the raw material from the Wulugu meat factory. They say when a blind man says you throw a stone, he's standing on one. I've already discussed with some private investors who are willing to come in and take those two projects up and revive them so that our young people can get work to do. Meanwhile, some residents of the area are anticipating the impact of the plants on the local economy. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima, Upper East Region. And that's it for business. I am Pius Kujubaka. I shall be back at 1 p.m. with the marketplace. Sports is next. Time now to bring you sports on the join news today with me, Muftao Nabila Abla, the flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, has revealed that the next NDC administration would ensure that the black staff is dominated by home based players. According to him, the consistent failure of the senior national team when it comes to participating at a continental and global level is due to the fact that the players are selected from all over the world, making it impossible for them to train and gel before the competition and he believes that with the right structures put in place by the government and the Ghana Football Association, the senior national team will be back to winning titles for the country. We just came from the African Cup of Nations and we performed abysmally, disastrously. And we, have, we performed abysmally because we are not growing our football. We are not before we used to have the Colts and every district used to organize its Colts League and they picked the promising players from there. We used to have the academicals. The schools used to play against each other and we picked the promising players from there before we come to under 17 and then all the other age groups. Unfortunately, all that has collapsed. And so we're going to work with the Football Association to start catching them young from when they are young so that we can train them and give them to local teams. They will play, get experience, before if they even want to travel abroad, they can travel. But we will build, we will build the new Black Stars based on homegrown players, domestic players who have trained together for a long time and work as a team. And then we'll bring the foreign ones to come and blend with them. If you bring only foreign players, they don't play together, they play in their individual teams, 
And then when it's time for competition, you bring them and come and tell them to play. It won't work. The core of the Black Stars must be made by domestic players who have played together for a long time. We keep camping them and they keep practicing together. And then when we are going for a, a, a competition, we can bring some of the foreign players to join the domestic players and you see that we'll have a better team. And so we're going to overhaul Ghana football in collaboration with the football, Ghana Football Association. And all the football associations from the district up, you are going to be busy because we'll send you resources so that you can hold football galas in your districts and you identify the players for us. And when you identify the players, we will give them scholarships, we'll send them to secondary school, we'll watch them as they grow and they play and eventually they'll end up in the national teams. And so we'll do all this in collaboration with the Ghana Football Association. To the African Games now, and the Minister of Youth and Sports has revealed that on Thursday, February 8th, the facility is being constructed to host the games will be used for a test run. He believes that the athletes need to use the facilities so that they can acclimatize before the competition starts on March 8, 2024. The Minister of Youth and Sports, Mustafa Yusif, says he's excited with preparations for Ghana's athletes and coaches so far ahead of the Games. 11 sporting disciplines are currently camping at the Cape Coast Stadium and the University of Cape Coast ahead of the Games. Boxing, arm wrestling, athletics, weightlifting, handball and basketball are some of the disciplines in camp. The Minister told their base on Thursday to ascertain the progress of their respective teams with just little over a month to go until the competition begins. Addressing the press after his visit, the Member of Parliament for Yagba Kubore expressed delight in what he saw at the team's base. I'm so excited and happy about what I've seen and you, you, uh, the athletes and officials themselves testified that this is the first time they are having a long duration of camping in the history of Ghana where they are having opportunity to come for a very long period and also even within improved facilities and uh, conditions of uh, service, the, where they are camping and everything, they are so happy. Once they are happy, I'm also happy. I came here to ensure that they've arrived and they are happy. From the indication, and I told all those facilities with you, both the officials and the athletes themselves have indicated that they are very excited and they are happy. I'm equally happy. The minister also added that the athletes will soon be moving to the University of Ghana to continue their camping. According to him, being closer to the Games Village will give them the opportunity to train at the new facilities and mark to host the Africa Games next month. They started camping. They arrived here in Cape Coast 19 January. They will be here until we move them to University of Ghana, they will continue their campaign there. We we'll have what we, what we have scheduled for 20 days count, countdown to the games, where the Ghana team, Team Ghana, will have opportunity of testing the facility, the new facilities that we have built, so that they will get used to those facilities. So on the on the 8th of February, Team Ghana will be moved to University of Ghana so that they can have those facilities to for them to be able to train. Then they will continue their campaign there till we move them to the Games Village to start the tournament or the competition itself. Some of the athletes who were present during the visit extended their appreciation to the minister for the continuous support and promised to repay the country with medals. With the help of our coaches, we say that we wouldn't let you down. We are doing our best and you know we are also doing the best for us. So expect the best from us. Thank you. Thank you. For the first time, we have a good ground for training with all mats fixed, and then we have air conditioning. It's because all the time, we train under the heat, and then when we go to the competition venue, there's air conditioning, and then we struggle. So it's like this time, we are climatizing with everything, and then we get ready to fight. Thank Ghana team, and you know, the ministries, and honorable Mustafa, you see, because as coaches, I'll not say uh, more, but because I've said it all, um, in Ghana, we are coming, no long talk, follow no road, our coaches know the road, so we are following them. 
That is, it is what it is. Uforia Sari, who is the coach for the Black Bombers, also assured Ghanaians the boxing team will be aiming for more medals when the competition begins. We know that um, Africa is coming to Ghana and uh, we cannot sit down here for them to come and uh, walk over us. So uh, we know the task is very, very big because uh, it is like there is a pressure on us. And so uh, we are making all effort uh, to make things happen. Some of the disciplines engage in demonstration drills for the visiting minister. The games are scheduled to begin on March 8 with a closing ceremony set for March 23. That's your sports for now. Who do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. We appreciate your time. And before we go, Aquitas Foundation, a non-governmental organization, is advancing a course to reduce unemployment rates in Ghana. Its grooming program targets tertiary graduates with little or no practical skills required by the job market. My colleague Matilda Ajato was there and has uh, reported on this. In Ghana, many people struggle to find jobs despite having a college education. Over the years, factors including population growth, skill gaps and change in the job market have contributed to the unemployment challenge. Tertiary graduates, despite the education, often face challenges in transitioning to the professional world because they lack the skills set required to make them employable. The grooming program by Equitas Foundation, a non-governmental organization, is changing the narrative by addressing gaps between academia and industry. The foundation equips graduates with practical training and support services in diverse fields of discipline to make them fit for the job market. At a forum to engage new cohorts and alumni on their skills progress thus far, co-founder of Equitas, Reverend Ikuya Oforibwatin, indicated their resolve to minimize unemployment rate in the country. I love the work that we do here. I love to see the impact that it has on young people. And the vision we have is to see young people find and pursue whatever it is that they are passionate about. People are not really pursuing what they are passionate about. And what I realize is that it's because most of our young people never get a chance to see, experience what it could be. I mean, you are a journalist. There are people listening to us who are dreaming they could be a journalist, but they never get the chance to even just try their hands at it to see, do I like it or do I not like it? And so Mary Kay Jackson is a sponsor for the foundation. Um, I saw Equitas in, in its very early days. Uh, my husband was a university lecturer and we know so many young people who went through university and then really struggled. And I've talked to so many people even this last couple of weeks as we've been back and visiting friends and family. Um, so many of the youth are struggling and they, they just don't even know where to turn and I'm hearing all of these stories about not you know, getting out with degrees and not having um, jobs or postings. Equitas is a fabulous organization because it really helps the young people find their direction and, and pursue their passion. And so we've listened to stories today of young people who have started their own businesses and who are employing others now. And this is the answer for the young people in Ghana today. Some beneficiaries of the foundation's activities spoke to Joy News. I'm Rita Ajeman. I, for instance, I came to the Equitas Foundation as an administrator, where I had passion doing um, accounting as well as audit. So during my period in the Equitas Experience Program, I spoke to Reverend about my passion, which is the accounting as well as the audit, where I was, in t I was given an opportunity to intern in one of the private accounting firms in Ghana, which is MOA Consult, where we do tax, business accounting, and then audit. So I came out as an audit intern. So at the moment, I'm working as 
and audit staff as well as the account officer for Equitas Foundation. My name is Grace Nancy Kawamade. I'm the CEO of Seas Glam and Hair. I was part of Equitas Experience Cohort 7, which was last year. Equitas Experience has been a total self-rediscovery for me and is the best thing that has happened to me. My name is Prince Sedu Chilki. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Chilki Group of Companies. I joined Equitas Foundation um, in the year 2022, the cohort five, and I might say this has been a transformational um, encounter through. And as I wrap up the bulletin this afternoon, my name is Aisha Varim. Log on to myjournline.com. There's more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Marketplace is up next to enjoy the rest of our programs.